Hey everybody. So today begins a new unit, uh, permutations, combinations, and the binomial theorem, uh, lovingly referred to collectively as combinatorics. Um, I have to tell you that I've been teaching this forever. Um, the very first year I taught it, this was like my least favorite thing to teach. I, it's to me, I was I was frustrated. I didn't understand the new this way of thinking because uh, it's a very different way of thinking. It's a very visual uh, unit. The math here isn't hard at all. Um, you know, the the most math you're doing is pushing a few buttons in your calculator and going like three times eight or stuff like that. Like the math is not complicated. It's setting the question up, understanding the visual behind it. Um, and I, I wasn't a huge visual person. So the first time I taught this, um, I had, a, I really, really struggled with it. Um, now, before you get all concerned about that, um, take us back or take us forward, I guess, several years from there. I have to tell you that this is probably in 30-1, one of my most favorite units to teach now because I get it, I understand it, um, but it takes some time. And so I really want to encourage you to give yourself some time. The more questions you can practice in the homework, um, the better, because it's not like you're going to just do this one question and then that's the question you're going to see on a test. Um, it's all about how do you set it up? What do you know? Uh, what are you trying to find out? And how do you set that up in the question? Okay, so um, I want this to be a lot of fun. I don't want it to be a stressful thing for you. Um, so make sure as we go through this, you're asking lots and lots of questions, okay? Um, so in our first lesson, uh, what we want to introduce is something called the fundamental counting principle, which you've actually been doing for a long time. You just nobody ever called it that. Um, but I think the fundamental counting principle itself will make a lot of sense to you. And then I want to introduce this concept of permutations to you as well, okay? So here is the mathematical definition of the fundamental counting principle. We'll just read it together. If a task is made up of individual steps or choices, then the total number of possibilities for the task is given by multiplying the number of choices for each step together. If M is the number of choices in the first stage, and N is the number of choices in the second, and P is the number of choices for the third, and so on and so on and so on, the total number of possibilities is given uh, for the task is given by m times n times p times whatever times whatever times whatever. Now you may read that and say, "Holy smokes, that's not that's not easy at all." Yes, it is. Let's just put it in perspective for a second, okay? Um, because, like I said, you have been doing this before. So here's the first question we're going to look at. Suppose you would like to choose an outfit from two pairs of pants, three shirts, and four pairs of shoes. How many different out outfits can be made? Now. You actually could have asked, been asked this question, say grade eight or grade nine. And what they would have gotten you to do, it would have been kind of in, in what they would have called a probability unit. Um, but what they would have done, maybe not, I don't know if they, sorry, I don't know if they would have called it probability or data management, but it would have been something like that. Anyway, what they would have done is they would have gotten you to do what's called a tree diagram. So I have, that's the first thing I'm gonna walk you through, I have, um, two pairs of pants. So let's just label that in my diagram as pant one, pant two. So, so far I have two options uh, for what I'm going to wear from my wardrobe. I could either choose to wear pant one or pant two. Now I go and take a look at the shirts. Well, I have three shirts. So that means I have three options for shirts, but I could choose those three options for shirts with pant one, or I could choose those three options for shirts with pant two. So both pant one and pant two branch off to talk about the shirt options. That's why we call it a tree diagram because there's a bunch of branches. Um, okay, so now you can see, hey, I actually have six different outfits. I could choose pant one with shirt one. I could choose pant one with shirt two. I could choose pant one with shirt three. I could choose pant two with shirt one, pant two with shirt two, or pant two with shirt three, okay? But I haven't taken into account my shoes. How many pairs of shoes do I have? I have four pairs of shoes. So at the end of each one of these branches, I can now branch off into shoe one, shoe two, shoe three, or shoe four, okay? So shoe one, shoe two, shoe three, shoe four, and I could do that for every shirt, 
Okay, so now this, I, I've taken care of everything and this outlines every outfit possible. So like for instance, I just gotta turn my ink on here for a second so you can see what I'm saying. I could choose as an outfit, pant two, shirt two with shoe four, there's one outfit. Or I could choose pant two with shirt one and shirt, sorry, shoe two, there's an outfit, okay? So I could just follow every one of these branches and get a different combination, get a different outfit, which means if I was to start counting up here, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, if I counted all that up, that would tell me my total outfits, okay? Great, so um, you've done that, you've drawn those before. Our suggestion now with the fundamental counting principle is, yeah, that's pretty, but like we're gonna be dealing with stuff that, uh, you know, there's gonna be like 180,000 combinations. Well, you don't want to have to draw that out. So now we wanna take that and look at it from a more mathematical standpoint instead of having to draw it all out. So the fundamental counting principle would say, hey, I have three different categories here. I have my pants, I have my shirt, and I have my shoes. So for my pants, there are two options. For my shirt, there are three options. And for my shoes, there are four options. And the fundamental counting principle would state, okay, just multiply those guys together. So two times three is six, and six times four is 24. So I get 24. Whether I do it this way, or whether I do it this way and count every one of those, I'm still gonna get 24 either way, okay? So um, I know I said this at the beginning, but th this is a very visual thing. So one of the things I want you to get into the habit of all the time, you'll notice when I went to the fundamental accounting principle, the first thing I did was I kind of started dashes and the dashes there are just representing the different categories that I have, okay? Um, you always wanna kind of draw yourself a little picture so that you understand what's happening. Okay. All right. So let's practice that a little bit. How many different license plates can be made that consist of three letters followed by three numbers if there are no other restrictions? So I set myself up. I have a six uh, character license plate. I've got three letters and I've got three digits. So I need to know how many letters in the alphabet. And if that sentence scares you, because it often does, uh, on your diploma, they would, um, they would tell you that information in the question. They're not expecting you to know anything about life. They're only expecting you to know math. Uh, so they, they would word the question to say, using all 26 letters of the alphabet. Um, so, hey, there's 26 letters in the alphabet. So everybody take a deep breath. It's all good. How many digits are there? Don't say nine, because uh, you have to remember that zero is a digit as well. So we would go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's actually 10 different digits. So I've got 26, 26, 26 for my three different letters. I've got 10, 10, 10 for my three different numbers. Multiply all that together. This is the easy part, right? The hard part was setting up the visual. Now I'm just taking my good old calculator and going 26 times 26 times 26 times 10 times 10 times 10. If you wanna do that quicker, that's 26 cubed times 10 cubed. Either way, you get 17,576,000. Don't be afraid of large numbers for answers in this uh, chapter, in this unit, okay? All right, now let's play with this a little bit. What if repetition is not allowed? Well, that changes things. I'm gonna still look at this first guy here. I'm gonna have 26 options for this first guy, no problem. But let me just write a 26 there for you for a sec. 26, okay. But once I get to this guy here, I have to think, okay, I don't have 26 options anymore because I can't repeat, which means I've used something in that first one, which means now there's only 25 letters. And likewise here, there's only gonna be 24 letters. Here I start using digits, so I've got 10, but now I've used a digit, so I only have nine left, and then I have eight left there, okay? So it would look some, whoops, sorry, it would look, something like that. And if we multiply it all that together, now we get down to 11,232,000, okay? All right, so let's go to the word English, determine the number of four letter arrangements that can be made from the word English 
if no letters can repeat. So, a couple of things I want to talk to you about here. First of all, I want to talk to you about the word arrangement. Um, I was being nice to you in this question because I also said, um, just getting my highlighter here, I said no letters can repeat. Okay, this will be the last time I ever do that for you. When you see the word arrangement in these questions, the word arrangement implies that letters cannot be repeated. Okay, so never again am I going to say the word arrangement and tell you letters cannot be repeated in the same question. As soon as you see the word arrangement, what I want you thinking about is Scrabble tiles. Okay, as soon as you use a Scrabble tile, it's used. You can't use it again. Okay, it's already on the, the game, so you can't reuse it. Okay, so I'm looking at English. No letters can repeat. It's a four letter arrangement. So, how many letters do I have in English? Well, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters in English, which means I have seven options for this first spot right here, and then six, and then five, and then four. Multiply all that together, and I get 840. Okay, so what if the first letter has to be an E? Well, <clears throat> there is only one E, which means there is only one thing I can put in that first letter an E. So let's just, just going to put one there. Now I have six letters left. So I have six, five, and four. So I'd have one times six times five times four, and that would be 120. Again, when I'm looking at these numbers, once I have that set up, I'm just multiplying all these numbers together. That's what the fundamental counting principle would state. Okay, what if the first and last letters are vowels? So you always have to deal with those restrictions first. Taking a look at the word English, E is a vowel, I is a vowel. By the way, if you're unsure, vowels, uh, just for clarification, because you never know, uh, A-E-I-O-U, okay? A-E-I-O-U, don't worry about why unless you're told to. Um, so there are five different vowels. But in the word English, I don't have all of those. I only have the E and I have the I. So I have two options for vowels, and it says the first and last letters are vowels, which means I have to put them in the first and last letter before I deal with the things that don't matter. When I say the things that don't matter, I mean like they can be in any order. So always deal with the restrictions first. So that means I'm going to put a two here and I'm going to put a one here because I have two, I have to put a vowel here and I have two vowels to, to pick from. And then when I get to here, I have to put a vowel there, but I've already used a vowel, so I only have one vowel left to pick from. So two there, one there. Now, I don't care about what's going on in the middle, except that I started with a six letter word. Was it six, two, four, six, seven? I lied to you, I'm sorry. I started with a seven letter word and I've now used uh, two vowel or two letters. Yes, they were vowels, but I've used two letters, which means I have five left uh, for this guy and four left for this guy, and then I multiply it through. So there would be 40 different ways uh, to do that. Okay, what if the word must contain a G? Well, um, let's just stick a G there. So I stuck a G, uh, then I have six letters here, I have five letters here, and I have four letters here. Now, before you get all excited and multiply that together, you should be yelling at me right now and saying, why did you put the G there? And it was completely random. And here's what I need you to understand. That G could be anywhere, okay? It doesn't have to be in the front. So you have to be careful. Me putting a G there in the front was just me getting a visual. Okay, so there are, there are six times five times four ways to stick that G in the front. But who's to say I couldn't put the G right there? Or right there? Or right there? So there are also four different arrangements of this setup because I could go, essentially, I could go, maybe it will help if I draw, draw this out for you for a sec. Um, think of it this way. I could go G with 6, 5, 4, or I could go 6, G, 5, 4, or 6, 5, G, 4, or 6, 5, 4, G. See, so I could put that G in four different spots. So ultimately, what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna say, okay, it's six times five times four, but then I'm gonna say it's times four because there's four different ways to do that, okay? 
So the G can be anywhere. I end up with 120. That's the six times five times four. And then I multiplied it by four because the G can be anywhere. So in total, I have 480 different options. Okay. In this fun, I really like this. I don't know if I said that yet or not, but I really like it. Uh, it grows on you, I promise. Okay, so now we're gonna do a similar question, but it's with digits. I have to tell you, dealing with digits is harder than dealing with letters because our brain gets confuzzled that the, the numbers we're putting in the spaces are the digits we're talking about, but they're not actually the digits we're talking about. The numbers you put in those spaces are always the, um, the number of options you have for that space, okay? So we're gonna look at the digits two, three, five, six, seven, and nine. Repetitions are not permitted. How many three-digit numbers can be formed? Well, that one's fairly straightforward. I have one, two, three, four, five, six digits I get to play with. It's a three-digit number, so there are six options for the front, five options for the next guy, and four options for the last guy. Again, I just want to remind you, this does not mean the number six. It means there are six different numbers I could put as the first digit, okay? So six times five times four is 120. Now, how many of these numbers are less than 400? Remember I said you always have to deal with the restrictions first. If I want a number less than 400, I have to think about the front guy. The front guy could only now be two or three, because if that front digit was five, I'd be looking at 500 and something that's not less than 400, or 600 and something is not less than 400. So the only things I can have as my very first digit is a two or a three, which means that changes what my first amount of options is. You always have to put in that restriction first. So I end up, there's two options for the front. Now, the rest of it I don't care about, except that I've used a digit, so I only have five options left for the second guy and four options left for the last guy. So that's gonna bring it down to 40 if I want those numbers to be less than 400. Okay, what about if I want an even number? Well, if I want an even number, I need to either end, let's look at what I've got available, I could end in a two or I could end in a six. Okay, so I'm gonna go right to the back this time and say, okay, there are two options for the back. I don't care about anything else. This doesn't have to be less than 400 anymore. So anything goes for the other two digits, except that I've used one. So I have five options for the front guy and four options for the second guy, and that ends up giving me 40 as well. Okay, how many are odd? Well, we're gonna do this two different ways, like the cooking show. If you can do it more than one way and get the same answer, um, it shows you understand the math better. So first way is I'm just gonna say, okay, if I want to be odd, some of you are sitting there saying, don't worry, Hill, you already are odd. <laughs> um, I have one, two, three, four spots that I could put, or four digits I could put in the back number and know that that number is gonna be odd, okay? so. I have four options for my back number. Now, I don't care about anything here, except that I've used a number, so it'd be five options in the front, four options for the second guy, because once I get to the second guy, I've already used two of the six numbers I originally had. Multiply all that together, and I get 80. Okay, so that's one way, setting it up with the fundamental counting principle. The second way is to use this notion of something called a complement, okay? Uh, the complement doesn't mean you have nice hair. It means the opposite of what I want, okay? So this concept of the complement is actually often very helpful in perms and cons. Um, so it takes the total and subtracting what you don't want. If I took the absolute total and I subtract what I don't want, what would be left over is what I did want, okay? So for this example, if I'm looking for odd, that means I don't want even, and I had already solved for even, and I had already solved for the total. So what I could do is I could take the total, which was 120, minus the even, which would be, which was 40 from the previous slide, um, and then that would give me what's left over, has to be odd, which is 80, okay? So you're gonna see that used from time to time as we continue in our little permutation and combination journey. Okay, how many are multiples of five? Well, in order to be a multiple of five, I need to end in five or zero. 
Zero is not an option in the digits that I'm using, so that means I only have one option for the back. I've now used a number, so there are five options left for the front and four options for the second guy, which means I've got 20 when I go five times four times one. Okay, how many arrangements of any number of letters can be formed from the letters of math? Now, we see the word arrangement again, um, so that means letters can't repeat. But now it's any number of letters. So that means I could have a one letter arrangement or a two letter arrangement or a three letter arrangement or a four letter arrangement. Okay, when you see this or here, um, that refers to separate cases. Okay, and what we have to do is we just have to figure out how many options we have for each case um, and then we add them together. Okay, anytime you see the word or, you'll add those separate cases together. So a one letter, that's pretty easy. There's just four options there. For two letter, I'd have four options for the front and three options for the next guy. Now, don't lose what I'm doing in my visual. This is not 43. This is four times three, right? I'm using the fundamental counting principle inside here. Then for a three digit, uh, sorry, for a three, yeah, a three, <laughs> sorry. Uh, if I want to have a string of three letters, I could not figure out how to say that, sorry. Uh, I'd have four times three times two. And then for four, a string of four letters, I'd have four times three times two times one. So uh, as I start cleaning this up, this guy here is four, this guy would be 12, this guy would be 24, and this guy would be 24. Add them all together for the separate cases, and I get a total of uh, 64. Okay. All right. Now we're going to get a little trickier here. The determine the number of odd numbers less than 5,000 that can be created using only the digits 2, 3, 4, 5 when digits cannot repeat. Okay. So less than 5,000. That means I could be a one digit number, I could be a two digit number. I could be a three digit number and I could be a four digit number. But there's a problem with the four digit number. Not a problem, but there's an extra restriction that we have to think about. So I just want you to kind of hear me out before I show you anything on the slide. If I have a four digit number and I need it to be odd, um, I could have a three or a five in the back. That would make it odd, right? I'm playing with this two, three, four, and five right here. So I could put a three or a five in the back and that would be totally okay. But I can't put a five in the front because if I had a five in the front, that number would no longer, remember it's a four digit number I'm talking about right now, that number would no longer be less than 5,000. It'd be 5,000 something if there's a five in the front, okay? So that means I actually have to split that up into two different cases because I have to control where the five is. So I'm going to have a one digit, a two digit, a three digit. Then I'm going to have a four digit that ends in a three and a four digit that ends in a five. And I'm going to look at each of those separate cases. Okay. The reason I had to split up the four digits is because um, I have to have control as to where the five is. Okay. So one digit, no problem there. There's four different options. Um, I'm, I completely lied to you because I didn't read the question. I'm sorry. There are two options because it has to be odd. So I can only put the three or the five there, right? I can't put the two or the four there because that would be an even number. Okay, I'll pay a little bit more attention. I'm sorry. Uh, for a two-digit number, again, there'd be two options here in the back to make it odd. And then anything goes in the front except that I've used one of those numbers. So there'd be two options in the back. And then originally four minus one, there'd be three options in the front. Okay, again, this is not 32. This is the fundamental counting principle. So this is three times two. For a three digit number, I have two options for the back. And then I have three options in the front and then two options in the middle. Okay, now for the four digit number, this one gets a little trickier. So I'm gonna slow down here a bit. Um, I would have, one option in the back because this four digit number ends in three. So there's only one option in the back. Now, here I've used one number, so I have three numbers left in play. That means there's three options, except 
There's not because one of those options is five and a five isn't allowed in front because that number would be greater than 5,000. So there are only two options that I can put in the front. Now, now that I'm getting to here, I don't care. Anything can happen in these guys, except that I started with four and I've used two. So there are only two options now that I could put here and then one option for that third digit. Okay, so that's where the 2211 is coming from. Last guy, again, I'm just gonna walk you through it step by step. We want to end in five. So there is one option in the back, the five, okay? Now, when I go to the front, I need to be a number that's less than 5,000. I've already used the five. So the only three that I have left to play with are the two, the three, and the four which means they can all be in the front and not be a number less than 5,000. So there's three options for the front. And then again, I have two and one in the middle. Okay, so three times two times one times one. So now when I kind of uh, put all that together, um, I end up with three times two is the six, three times two times two is 12, two times two times one and times one is four, and three times two times one times one is six. These are all separate cases. Remember we're saying or, anytime you're saying I could have this or I could have this or I could have this, um, I'm adding all those separate cases together. Um, so when I add them all together, I get 30 different numbers, okay? The good thing about watching this on a video, I really don't wanna be frustrating you with this. Um, I get that for some of you, for some of you, this is just going to click. You're like, hey, I totally get this. I totally see it. And for some of you, you're like, what the heck just happened? If you are a what the heck just happened sort of a person right now, that is totally okay. Please do not give up on perms and comms when we're like, what, 20 minutes into a lesson. Okay. But the good thing about watching this on video right now is you can rewind me. Okay. Go back five minutes and go through this whole example again. Um, sorry, you have to listen to my bad jokes twice, but um, go through the example as many times as you want and keep kind of drilling it into your head. The more you can talk yourself through this, the better you're going to feel about it, okay? Um, okay, so how many even three-digit numbers can be formed using the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, where repetitions are not allowed? So if I want to be even, uh, I could end in zero, two, or four. Problem, um, zero is an option here. Zero can't go in the front of a number. So like zero, one, two is not a three digit number. That would be classified as a two digit number because you can't just start with zero like that. Zero could go, so listen really carefully for a sec. Zero could go in the back. Zero can't go in the front. Saying those two statements together, Based on the last example that we did, um, I want you to say, hey, I have to control where zero is in order to do this, which means I have to split this into two different cases, okay? Case one, I'm gonna end in zero. Case two, I'm gonna end in two or four, which is my non-zero there, okay? So if I end in zero, I have one option for the back right here, zero, right? Okay, now think about what I have left. If I've just used zero, I have these guys left, okay? But I want to be, yeah, I just want to be a three digit number. So anything could go in the front of those guys. So I have four here and I have three for the next guy. Okay, so the second case says ends in a non-zero. Okay, so let's just draw this out so that we get a good visual. Um, a non-zero is either the two or the four right now, because remember it has to be an even number. So ending in a two or a four would still make the number even. So that means there are two things that I could put in the back, okay? Now, let's just walk us through what we're doing here. All together, I had five numbers. One, two, three, four, five numbers I was playing with. I just stuck a number in the back, okay? So I started with five. I don't know whether I stuck the two or the four there, but it doesn't matter. I've used one number, so now I'm down to four. Zero can't go in the front, which means for the front, there are only three options, okay? So that's where the three is coming from here. Now, 
for the middle guy, anything goes in the middle guy except that I've already used two digits of my five. So there's only three left. Okay, so four times three times one is 12 and three times three times two is 18. And I add those separate cases together and I would get 30. Okay. All right, factorial notation is next on our list. Consider how many ways there are to arrange six different books side by side on a shelf. Well, based on everything we just talked about, we would go, hey, that's six times five times four times three times two times one. I put all that in my calculator and get 720. Great, what if I said 50 books? Well, sure, I'd go 50 times 49 times 48 times 47 times 46 times, and then you can think, okay, that's long, and it's a huge number, and there's got to be an easier way to state that, okay? And that's what I wanna to talk to you about next. That easier way is called factorial, factorial notation. Now, this is what it looks like. Don't let this scare you for a second, for lots of reasons, just stay with me. Number one, it's an exclamation mark, so it looks very excited, right? Uh, what that exclamation mark means is it means we start at the number and we go to the one previous. So. Take a look, let me draw this for you. Um, so I'm starting at the number right here, and then I go to the one previous. Well, that's what n minus one means, right? If I started at 10, 10 minus one is nine. Nine is the one previous, okay? Then I go to the one previous to that, which would be my original number minus two. And then I go my original number minus three, my original number minus four. That mathematically is just saying, hey, I'm counting down each time. Okay, and I would keep doing that until I get to three times two times one. So I go all the way down to one, essentially. Okay, now the other nice thing is it's a button on your calculator. So if you are a child of Casio, you're pressing option uh, F6, F3, F1. Uh, permutations and combinations, you're going to notice a huge benefit of, of Casio because what you'll notice is that menu pops up you see that F1 is your factorial. Uh, in this unit, we use F1, F2, and F3 all the time. So that menu is now there for you and you don't have to keep going back to find it. Uh, TI Kids, you do the same thing or you can get to the same button. It's just a few more buttons to press because for you guys, you'll have to keep pressing this. Uh, but it's math. You go over to probability, which you can either go three to the right or you can go one to the left and it will quickly go over to the right side for you. And then option four is your factorial button. Okay, now don't bother with the 50 because um, that you'll get an overflow in your calculator. That is actually legit too big a number for your calculator to handle. Um, but go back to the six books, okay? Um, we went six times five times four times three times two times one, and we said that that was 720. I'd now like you to just go six factorial. That was a really bad six, sorry, but go six factorial. So six and then press that button and you'll notice that you get uh, 720 as well, okay? So, calculate or simplify the following. So, let's start with nine factorial. All I want you to do there is be good button pushers. Just go nine, press the factorial button. You should get 362,880. Now, 10 factorial over seven factorial, hold off, don't press anything. I want you to do this guy in your head. Now, here's what I want you to understand with this, okay? Um, 10 factorial, just humor me for one second. 10 factorial means 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. That's what a definition of a factorial is. Yeah, everybody with me? Okay, so doesn't it also mean that I could say that this is 10 factorial times 10 times nine factorial? Because nine factorial, would be nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. Or couldn't I say 10 factorial is 10 times nine times eight factorial? Because eight factorial is eight times seven times six times four times three times two times one. Okay, you with me? So what I'm saying is I can expand a factorial until I don't want to anymore. And as soon as I want to stop, I can stop. 
as long as I put the factorial sign back on the number that I want it to stop with, because that will keep that chain going all the way down to one for me. Okay, so some of you are seeing what I want you to think about now. I can do 10 factorial as 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 factorial, and then my 7 factorials would actually divide each other out, and this question just becomes 10 times 9 times 8. Well, 9 times 8 is 72, times 10 is 720, so you could actually do this guy in your head. Okay? All right, and then that brings us to dealing with just number or letters as well, n factorial over n minus 2 factorial. So what you want to do, if you go back to this example, you took the larger number, 10 was larger than 7, so you took the larger number and you brought it down one by one until it hit the smaller number and then you stopped and put your factorials on that. So we're going to do the exact same thing. Who's bigger, n or n minus 2? n is bigger. You're correct if you said that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to expand n. Who comes before n? Well, think about that factorial example I just gave you. n minus 1 would come before n. So n breaks down to n minus 1 and then breaks down to n minus 2. Well, that's what I want. I want the n minus 2, so I stop there and put the factorial sign back. You can go as far as you want as long as when you stop, that factorial sign right there comes back. Now, my n minus 2s would divide each other out, and I'm left with n times n minus 1, which is, I'll just distribute that, that's n squared minus n. Okay? Awesome. Have I mentioned how much I love this stuff? Okay. <clears throat> So, you try this one. This would be a good time to pause me. <clears throat> um, n minus 3 is the bigger term, so I'm going to bring that down until I see n. So, what comes before n? Sorry, I said n minus 3. That, that's n plus 3. What comes before n plus 3? n plus 2. So, I'm going to go n plus 3, n plus 2, n plus 1, n. That's where I want to stop, so my factorial sign goes back. My n's divide each other out and I'm left with n plus 3 times n plus 2 times n plus 1. Now, there are instances where you'd have to multiply all that together. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, now, I'm going to introduce this word permutation. A permutation is an arrangement of a set of objects in which the order of the objects is important. Now, you are going to hear every math teacher over and over and over again say, does order matter, does order matter, does order matter? because if order matters, uh, it's a permutation. But I need you to understand what we mean by that statement, does order matter? Because often I think what happens is kids hear does order matter and they transmit that to be, do I care about the order? And a lot of these things that we're gonna do, you're gonna be like, I don't care who's standing who, who or who's standing where. Um, and, and that's not what we're talking about. When we say does order matter, we're saying does changing the order produce a different result, okay? So if Sally and Timmy and Jade line up for a picture and I take their picture that way, is that a different picture than if Jade and Sally and Timmy lined up? And yes, it is. Like if I looked at those two pictures, they would be different because they're in a different order. So the picture's different, okay? So changing the order produces a different result. That's what a permutation is. Okay, in a couple of lessons, we're going to talk about what looks like uh, or what a combination looks like, which is where changing the order doesn't produce a different result. Okay, um, but for now, we're just going to focus on instances where changing the order does produce a different result. Okay, now this is a button and a formula. The formula is on your formula sheet and it looks like this. Okay, this we would say n permute r. N refers to the number of, um, you'll often hear me say, what's in your pool, what's in your, your uh, selecting pool. But um, what we mean by that is the number of objects that we have to pick from. And then R is the number of objects that we want from the total amount, okay? We don't always, like remember, um, I asked you a while ago with the word English, I asked you to give me a four letter arrangement. Well, there were seven letters in the word English. Um, and I only wanted four of them, okay? So in this example, that seven would be your N, it's the total amount of letters you have to select with, and then 
R would have been how many letters you actually want to use. You only wanted to use four of them. Okay, and so this formula, oops, sorry, I'm not quite sure actually how that happened. This formula is on your formula sheet, okay, and you will have to understand how to work it. Um, zero factorial is considered one. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail where that comes from, but it is something you need to understand because by definition of a factorial, we go down to only um, one, okay. Um, and it is a button on your calculator. If you're a child of Casio, you don't have to press these buttons if you still have that menu open. These buttons here are just to open up that menu. You will notice that F1 was your factorial button, F2 says NPR. Um, and then for TI, you again go into your probability, so math, go to probability, and then you'll see it as option two. And for both Casio and TI, how you do this is you type whatever N is first, then you press that button, and then you type whatever R is, and then you hit enter. Okay, so let's go back to the bookshelf question. Uh, remember, I have six different books on a shelf. If I'm using the fundamental counting principle, um, I would go six times five times four times three times two times one, or I could just go six factorial. If I was using the permutation formula, well, N is six, and R is six, I have six to work with, and I want to work with all six. So looking at that formula from my formula sheet, I'd have six permute six, and that equals six factorial over six minus six factorial, which is six factorial over zero factorial. Remember, we just said zero factorial is one, uh, which means I'm left with six factorial again, which is just 720. Or using your calculator, um, please make sure you can press the buttons in the proper order, go six, press your NPR button, and then press six, and you again should get 720, okay? Does it matter which way you use? No, but you have to tell me what you're doing. You have to write something down to be showing your work for me, okay? Okay, so how many ways can the letters of the word Regina be arranged? Does the order matter? Yes, the order matters. If I said R-E-G, that's different than if I said G-E-R, so changing the order produces a different result. Uh, if I count up the letters, one, two, three, four, five, six letters, I want to arrange them all so that six factorial equals 720. Okay, six P six, if you wanted to do it that way, also 720. How many three letter arrangements can be made from the word graphite? Does the order matter? Yes, any sort of arrangement like that, the order would matter. G-R-A is different from A-R-G, right? So changing the order produces a different result. Um, so again, there's a diff few different ways you could look at this. You could say, hey, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters. Um, I want three of them, so I could go eight permute three. I could use the fundamental counter principle and just say eight times seven times six. Uh, totally doesn't matter. Either way, you're going to get 336. Okay, solve for n. Well, <clears throat> n permute two equals 12. Um, and then we're gonna state and explain the non-permissible values as well. So let's actually do that first part. State and explain the non-permissible values. Couple of things you need to understand. Um, I think we've understood already that N would, can't be a negative number because I stop at one. But more than that, um, N can't be less than R. Like I can't have one in my selection pool and then pick two from them, right? And N has to be a member of the natural family because I, yeah, I can't pick 1.5 things, right? You can, never, you can never select a decimal. Decimals are only ever used in, in instances where you're measuring something. Um, you can't select 0.5 of an item. You either select the item or you don't select the item, okay? So I said as my explanation, N must be a natural number greater than or equal to two. It can't be less than two because we need to select two and we can't select a piece of one, which is why the number must be natural. Now, to algebraically solve this, I'm just gonna use my formula. I know that n is n right now, and r is two, so I go to my permutation formula. It says n factorial over n minus r factorial. I know that r is two, so I just replaced my r with two. Now, I need to get rid of the factorials, and I do that by expanding. Remember that it's the top, uh, not necessarily the top, but it's the bigger guy, 
that gets expanded down to meet the smaller guy. In this instance, it is the top because n is larger than n minus 2. So what comes before n? n minus 1. What comes before n minus 1? n minus 2. So we did a question similar to this earlier. These guys are now going to divide each other out, and that gets rid of my factorial. And I have a cute little quadratic to solve. I end up with n squared minus n equals 12. I'll bring that 12 over and I'll factor. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 12 and add together to give me negative 1. So that factors into n minus 4 times n plus 3, uh, which means n could be negative 3 or 4, but based on the conversation we just had, n can't be negative 3, so n has to be 4. Okay? Now, it is super important, I know I've said this in other contexts, it is super important for me as a teacher to see this step. I know that n can't be negative 3, but I need to see all the solutions that are possible, and then I need your communication to me to be, okay, I know that negative 3 doesn't work, so now I'm just going to conclude 4. If you don't put the negative 3 there, I don't know whether you know it doesn't work or whether you just missed it, okay? So you have to state all your solutions and then state what the correct solutions are after that okay all right oh let me get rid of the uh, ink there for you okay determine the extraneous solution to the following equation so let's just start dealing with this first thing we want to do is um, take my two uh, permutations and use the permutation formula to expand them so remember it's n factorial over n minus 4 so this guy here is going to end up being n factorial over n minus 4 factorial. Sorry, I think I just said n minus 4. I meant n minus r. I was staring at the 4 uh, when I said that. So that guy's going to break into n factorial over n minus 4 factorial. This guy, n is n minus 1, right? This is where n is. So n is n minus 1 and r is 2. So this guy's going to say n minus 1 factorial on the top. And then on the bottom, it's n minus r. So that would be n minus 1 minus 2. Okay. So I'll show you that. And then that was being multiplied by 28. So the 28 just appears there. Okay. Now, we could do a couple of different things here. The first thing I'm going to do is actually, I'll just clean this up. This will be n minus 3. Um, and then what I did was I ended up just multiplying both sides by n minus 3. And that got rid of this guy on the division statement and it ended up being putting it over here. And then I multiplied both sides by n minus 4 to get rid of this as a division and it ended up over here. Okay, so essentially I, I essentially cross multiplied there if you want to think of it that way, but I multiplied both sides by n minus 3 and then I multiplied both uh, factorial and then I multiplied both sides by n minus 4 factorial. Okay, now I want to work on trying to expand this a bit so I can get rid of something. Um, I know that if I took n minus 4, actually, sorry, I want to say that the other way. Um, I'm going to delete that before I confuse you. If I took n minus 3 and expanded it, what comes before n minus 3? n minus 4. So I could take n minus 3 factorial and expand that to be n minus 3 times n minus 4 factorial. Okay, then I could take my n and expand that to be n times n minus 1 factorial. Okay, and what I'm trying to do is get um, some things that will divide each other out. Okay, so I took my n and expanded that into n times n minus 1 factorial. And then I took my n minus 3 factorial and expanded that into n minus 3 n minus 4 factorial. Why would I do that? Because now I can divide both sides by n minus 1 factorial and that's gone. And I can divide both sides by n minus 4 factorial and that's gone. Okay, so when I clean that up a bit, that leaves me with n times n minus 3 equals 28, which is n squared minus 3n minus 28 equals 0. I'm ready to start factoring. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply together to give me negative 28 and add together to give me negative 3. 
that ends up being negative seven and four, which gives me n is negative four and seven. I know that n can't be negative four, so my answer is seven, but the question said, what's the extraneous solution? So the negative four is actually my extraneous solution because n can't be negative and because r cannot be less than one, okay? So that's how we kind of work with some of this stuff algebraically as well. Asking you for an extraneous solution is great because you can't just play around on your calculator till you get it. You actually have to go through the process to find the extraneous solution. Okay, so um, that wraps me up for now. Um, your pages are here for homework and uh, give it a shot. Like I said at the beginning, the more you can practice this, the better. Okay, this will not come naturally for a lot of you and that's totally okay. As you keep practicing it and as you keep kind of fighting through the visual, it will start to feel a little better, I promise. Okay, um, you know where I am though. I'm only an email away. Please, please ask lots and lots of questions. Okay, take care guys.